40 years uh, researching uh, the, the Boyne Valley, uh, which is probably one of the most uh, incredible complexes of the planet. You know? uh, and uh, I, I think you'd agree with me, uh, it's probably been uh, the most exciting uh, couple of months uh, in archaeology that we've been through uh, for the last couple of months. So even people that know that I have a remote kind of interest in archaeology have been hitting me up <laughs> the last couple of weeks. What's that thing in the field? You know? uh, what's this image I keep seeing all over Twitter? Uh, and I think uh, over, am I right in saying, Anthony, about 200 news companies from all around the world cover this story. Yeah. So it's a truly global uh, story about uh, Anthony's recent spot. But uh, tonight he's maybe going to talk about uh, an incredible alignment. Recent discoveries uh, in the Wine Valley. So, would you give a warm, pushing up round of applause? Thanks so much, uh, Justin, for the very nice welcome. It's lovely to be here at uh, the centre of all things. And so, up until a few months ago, I would have said that Bruna Bonia was the centre of the universe, you know. But um, people have been trying to convince me otherwise that, in fact, Ishnak, Ushnak, Ushna is the centre of the universe. I'm, I'm, I'm not inclined to argue with that too much. Um, so tonight, uh, I want to talk about two things. Firstly, I want to talk about an alignment. I became interested in alignments myself very early on in my own research work, which began 19 years ago, which is to those astronomers in the room, a full metonic cycle uh, in 1999. And I'm fascinated by the apparent correlation of ancient sites, particularly Stone Age or Neolithic sites, across long distances. And my equal fascination with the Boyne Valley um, and my insistence on spending so much time there out in the uh, in the landscape has revealed um, lots of interesting things this summer. Anyway, I should I suppose before I really get started, I should start with the disclaimers. So the first one is I'm not an archaeologist. Okay, so I um, I read about all this stuff and I'm fascinated by what archaeologists do, but I don't have any formal training in archaeology. If I err in any way, that's my fault and obviously not theirs. Um, the second one is that I'm not an astronomer. <laughs> um, not a professionally trained one anyway. I've been watching the sky since I was a young boy. Uh, totally enthralled since I can't remember what age I was. I was in short pants a long time ago. And totally thrilled and enthralled by the night sky. And of course, um, the third thing is that I'm, I'm, I'm not a mythologist either. <laughs> but, like, who is? Because what is mythology except for telling stories? And so I see, in my work anyway, I see a lovely correlation between archaeology, astronomy, and mythology. As I said in Island of the Setting Sun, my first book... <coughs> You know, where stars, stones and stories collide is where you see a lovely convergence. Anyway, uh, you all probably know what's on the screen here. Um, I call it Island of Miran. I'm not sure if there's variations on the pronunciation. In the school's folklore, I saw it anglicised as M-E-E-R-A-N, so I took it that it should be pronounced Miran. Um, Justin, you might correct me on that, whether if he's in, he's not in the room. Um, Thanks, so, so again, I'll learn. Learn. Yeah. It's like when I went to look up the, the, to learn a little bit of information about Ariel, I found that there were 14 different spellings of her name, and thus probably many different pronunciations. So you know yourself. Anyway, what started all this was this man, Michael Dames, published a book in 1992 called Mythic Ireland. 
I did not know of the existence of this book in March of the year 2000 when I set up my website, Mythical Ireland. Uh, republished in around the year 2000 as Ireland, A Sacred Journey. Uh, remarkable work, a very uh, astute and academic work, but at the same time poetic and lyrical. This is uh, a gentleman who I think has found his poetic voice. And sort of three quarters of the way through this book is this fascinating diagram. <coughs> and I've always been interested in it. And so um, Dames postulates that there is a series of alignments that radiate out of the sacred centre of Ireland. So um, I suppose just before I completely get kicked off, how many people in the room are already familiar with the mythology and the archaeology of Ishnak? So that's probably about a third less, maybe. <coughs> okay, that's okay. So you don't mind if I repeat some stuff then. Um, yeah, and so from I, I, I was shown this, I mean, maybe 18 or 19 years ago, and I just thought this was incredible. This was one of the things that set me on a path. So when I met Richard Moore, who was my co-author on Island of the Setting Sun in 1999, one of the things that we did back then was we used to put the Ordnance Survey maps out on the ground and trace lines across them. Um, I don't really know why. I mean, this sort of work had been done and then there were people who had written about ley lines. Some people who wrote about ley lines in terms of energy lines. But I was more interested in ley lines in terms of the traditional description of a ley line emanating from the work of Alfred Watkins in the UK in the 1920s. What he called the old straight track, alignments of sacred sites along very straight lines and across huge distances of landscape. And so when I saw this, I just thought this was, this was possibly a work of magic, you know. And then over the intervening, say, six, seven years, Richard and I documented several uh, long-distance alignments of sites. One of those, which I think is very significant, is the alignment of Newgrange with Fornox. So the passage of Newgrange, although Fornox is not visible from Newgrange, the passage of Newgrange effectively points at Fornox. And that is a winter solstice alignment. Uh, and there's another site, a very large enclosure on a hill called Mount Fortescue in County Louth, which is also precisely on this alignment. It's a mound on top of the hill with an enclosure around it of unknown date because it hasn't been dated. So the mound is likely to be either Bronze Age or Stone Age and the enclosure I would reckon is probably a Bronze Age but possibly an Iron Age thing. Anyway, one of many long distance alignments. And something that kind of came, became obvious was that in some cases, these alignments are extraordinarily precise. And that was demonstrated when Google Earth became a thing. For me, that happened around the year 2004, 2005. There was a free program that you could download off the internet that showed you the Earth, that you could zoom in and out of, that you could look at sites, and that critically you could trace lines between them or as we might per more precisely refer to them as arcs, because they follow the curvature of the Earth's surface. But if you're thinking in two dimensions, it's a line. Anyway, following my visit to Ishnak this year for the Bialtana Fire Festival, uh, what a fabulous reinvigoration of an ancient event. And full credit uh, to David and to all of the people involved in making that happen. It's a... Uh, I think it's actually a prophecy of reinvigoration of ancient things. It's there in the folklore. So anyway, this is how Dames laid out the alignment uh, from Ishnak, which is very strongly connected with Dagda, Eriu, Lu in particular, Fala. So what he was essentially saying is that it, an observer situated at Ishnak at midsummer, summer solstice, would watch the sun rising in the direction of Shlina Kalia at Loch Cru, and in the further distance at Shlev Gullion in Armagh, and in the opposite direction for midwinter sunset uh, in the direction of Shlev Auti. So for today's uh, talk, 
the second part of today's talk is devoted to the recent discoveries at Newgrange. So there are two very uh, separate subjects, but they are kind of related. So the three sites that we're dealing with today are Ishnak, in particular, Isle of Mirren, Loch Crew, Schleep Macalia, and Schleep Gully in uh, the Cali Beerus House. So uh, you, you probably all know already Isle of Mirren, if you've been to it, called the Cat Stone or the Stone of Divisions, it is like, um, it, you know, I mean, archaeologically speaking, it is, well, geologically speaking, it is an erratic. It's a stone that was dropped by the ice. Uh, 30 tons, I think, limestone. 16 foot high. But it's not so much what it's made of, it's what it represents. And that it has a very sort of great significance to the ancients. So I want to read briefly a little bit about what uh, Danes writes about Mija, the mythical fifth province, the unifying province, the centre of Ireland. The Irish word for province, Hokage, also means a fifth. Yet the ancient and continuing division of the island into four provinces of Ulster, Munster, Leinster and Connacht seems to leave no room for a fifth part. The discrepancy has sometimes been explained by recalling how, at certain historical periods, Munster was subdivided into two, thereby turning the four provinces into five. Yet many scholars think that the elusive fifth stands for something more fundamental. The likelihood is that ever since the Stone Age, and despite numerous boundary changes in detail, Ireland has been sub subdivided into four provinces held together by a mystical fifth, territorially elusive, yet vital to the cohesion of the whole sacred array. The fifth province was called Mija. The four plus one pattern of which Mija formed the centre could be seen as the outcome of Ireland's compact shape. But since the mythic view of reality declares that efficiency is the outcome of magical accord between the seen and the unseen, there is more to Mija than just simple geometry. In Mija, people could encounter the gods on the most sacred ground. Like a good idea, its space was small yet extendable. As a national head and brain, it coordinated intelligence from the other provinces. Mija, the notional centre of Ireland, was conceived as a point where an umbilical cord attached the country to the womb of the gods, who endlessly created and sustained its existence from above and below. Yet Mija was a real place, namely the hill of Ishnak, now in County Westmead. It was also identified with a large boulder called Isle Mirren, standing on Ishnak's southwest slope and with the various archaeological sites visible on the hill. And so, the vista afforded by a viewer on the top of Ishnak is quite impressive, um, and we'll, we'll discuss that too. The idea, you know, whenever you're on a hill in Ireland or an eminence, there's nearly always a local piece of information about how many counties you can see from up there. I think in the case of Ishnak, it's 20 if I'm not mistaken. But all the time throughout my own research, any time I was on a hill, and it didn't matter where the hill was or in what county or what part of the country, somebody local could tell you, do you know those 12 counties can be seen from up there, or 15 counties, or whatever. The idea being that at sacred sites, and I'm particularly interested in the Neolithic, I find that vista and horizon seems to have been very important. So visitors, for instance, to the Hill of Tara, one of the really unusual things about Tara is from any distance, Tara doesn't stick out as an eminence. It doesn't rise up steeply and protrude from the landscape. It, it's almost understated. And yet standing on Tara, you have the most wonderful vista from north to east to south to west. Uh, you can see Loch Crew, not entirely sure, whether you can see Ishnak. I know you can see Crohan Hill uh, in Offaly. So really, the story today starts with this very sacred stone under which the goddess herself is said to be buried, are you? And actually, funny enough, that pathway I find very intriguing 
Because it kind of goes in the right direction for the story too. Uh, anyway, um, this is a very, very impressive. Uh, as a, it, it wasn't, I suppose, a, a standing stone that was put in place by humans. Some of the standing stones in Ireland are quite massive. <coughs> So the second site involved in today's discussion is Loch Crew. And again, exactly the same thing. Standing at Loch Crew, you get the most wonderful, magical views across the landscape. And if you don't mind keeping a secret, just between me and yourselves, and nobody else. And I didn't say this, just plausible deniability here, there are only 45 of you. <laughs> La Crue is more beautiful than Brunegogne from the point of view of the views and the vista and the barrenness and the ruggedness of the landscape. It is exceptionally beautiful. The goddess, the Kalyak, she lives on there very much, very much so. One gets the sense of being elevated, removing oneself from the, the daily trudge and toil of life and ascending to more heavenly realms as if this was the purpose of these things to be built on hills and you know this is another thing this is really funny this was taken in March you know um, <coughs> not in December or January you know when we'd had this snow and we had a really extraordinary year weather wise we had a very prolonged winter and a very you know a very heavy snowfall and then we pretty much went straight into summer we hardly had a spring at all. So some of you would be familiar with the story of Loch Croon. The story of Loch Croon is that the Kalyuk, the hag, created the cairns. And not really just the cairns. In essence, she created the landscape. And that she jumped from hill to hill. And as she did so, she dropped stones out of her apron to form cairns. Now, the Kalyuk is not local to Loch Croon. She can be found. She is ubiquitous. She can be found in various different parts of Ireland. And the story of the apron of stones is not peculiar to Ireland either. I recently met an archaeologist who told me that one of the Stone Age cairns in Anglesey, either, oh my God, I'm going to, I'm going to do the worst mispronunciation ever, Bryn Kessley D or Barclodiad E Goris. Now, I'm sorry, I can't speak Welsh. One of those, the same story is that the high emptied her apron full of stones to create. At Loch Crew, she said to have died when she reached the easternmost hill and slipped and fallen and was buried in a cairn there. Recent archaeological work yet to be published suggests that there was a massive cairn on Patrickstown, the easternmost of the hills, which may or may not have been the place where she was buried. <clears throat> Determined now her tomb to build, her ample skirt with stones she filled, and dropped a heap on Carn Moor, then stepped 1,000 yards to Lore, and dropped another goodly <coughs> heap, and then with one prodigious leap, gained Carn Beg, and on its height, displayed the wonders of her might. And when she approached death's awful doom, her chair was placed within the womb of hills whose tops with heather bloom. And of course, love the idea of tombs being wombs, going all the way back to the work of Maria de Butas who describe passage tombs as passage wombs. So this is uh, the landscape of Loch Crew, uh, viewed from satellite imagery, from a probably, I think, Bing maps in this case. So the four hills, originally, I think the older names, Carnban, Schlieberua, Schliebnacalia, and, well, Patrickstown is probably a Christian name. These, these days, they call them Carnban West and Carnban East, but Carnban East was Schliebnacalia. And Schlieberua, also known as Carrigbrack, the speckled hill. Oh, whoops. Hang on a second. So on each of the peaks, there are <coughs> scatterings of cairns. The labelling systems are uh, antiquated, uh, dating probably from the time of Eugene Conwell in the 1860s, when cairns were just given letters. One of the great shames about Brunevonia is that in the Dinshemicus, there is a description of the names of the monuments. And what, you know, who they were named after or what they were for. And sometime we lost that. And then we, we came up with these arbitrary labels. Mound A, Mound B, Standing Stone C, you know. Uh, unfortunately. And so in Cairnban East we have Cairn T, the most famous. And Cairn S and Cairn B and Cairn U. You, you follow the pattern. 
However, one name survives from the older times, and that is the Hag's Turn and the Hag's Chair, which is identified with Karen T. That's a picture of the Hag's Chair or Throne. Ooh. One of the most unusual curved stones of any uh, Neolithic chambered cairn in Ireland. The most unusual. Um, Fantastic. Uh, weighing about 10 tonnes, inscribed with megalithic art, and with... Uh, a seat or like a, like a seat on the top of it. It's also inscribed with a cross, but that's definitely very recent. Well, I mean, recent. So who is the mysterious hag or Khalyak to whom the great throne belongs? Of course, this is a big question, isn't it? So she has different names. The Kali Vera, Evelyn, Garavog, and even Queen Talche. Uh, I have speculated that the second part of her name might from the Irish birch or birch meaning a burden or a load or a bundle from the bundle of stones that she carries with her and the third of the sites Sheep Gullion in the county of Armagh um, a huge round womb like mountain or belly like mountain upon which there are two cairns either side of a lake and this is the southernmost of the cairns and as you can see, it is uh, very much what you would call a heap of stones, which I suppose is the best description of a cairn, a heap of stones, in this case covering a chamber and a passage. There is a very old lady whose shade still haunts the lake and cairn of Schlieb Gullion in the county of Armagh. Her name was Evelyn, and it would appear from some legends about her that she was of the Danonite origin. origin. And of course, the two of the Danon in... Certainly in Brunabonia are the, the gods or the godlike people who were responsible for the construction of the monuments and the distribution thereof. And they kind of kept, <coughs> kept charge of them, as it were. Whoa, 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 whoa. I have no idea what's happening. <coughs> Technology. So this is a picture taken from inside the chamber of the Calibira's house on Sheep Gullion. There's no megalithic art in there. It's not like uh, the Brunabonia sites and it's not like Loch Crew. It's very different in that regard. It's made from a lot of smaller stones. You don't see the huge passage and chamber orthostats, these huge blocks. If I was to speculate, and again, <clears throat> referring back to the fact that I'm definitely not an archeologist, I would suggest that they used what stones were available to them on the peak of the hill. Um, and there weren't so many of the big stones up there the erratics that you might have found, for instance, on the peaks of Loch Crew. This is a wonderful photo taken by Ken Williams uh, of Shadows and Stone. We'll hear a bit more about Ken as well this evening. Uh, taken on the evening of winter solstice from the chamber of the Calivera's house at Sheep Gullion. Now, a little known fact, or it seems to be gaining in, in, uh, in knowledge, common knowledge, is that a viewer in the chamber of the Calivera's house looking out towards the place where the sun sets on winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, is in fact looking at the hills of Loch Crew in the distance. Effectively, the sun sets over Loch Crew. Now, here's an example of, you know, there's a sort of a, a what would you call this, a sighting post or something, where it shows you all the features that are visible. I was very interested, one of them is the cement works at Drogheda, which is just outside where I live, I live in Drogheda. 32 miles this way, the cement works in Drogheda. 85 miles in this direction, the Schlieve Bloom Mountains. And what's missing from it is, you know, 30 whatever miles it is, or how many kilometres, that 50 something kilometres to the southwest is Loch Crew. <coughs> so we'll have to talk to the maker of this and get Loch Crew added. So just back to James's uh, proposed summer solstice alignment uh, from, well, involving Ishna and Loch Crew and Schlieve Bullion. Now, I'm not aware of whatever methods Michael James might have used to calculate his alignments in 1992. I know that pre-Google Maps, myself and Richard Moore used to use like physical ordnance survey maps. And, you know, the Discovery Series maps had all the archaeological features marked as red dots on them. But the thing is, it's been hit and miss because not all the sites were marked on it. Um, and so we just used to literally put out a thread from one place to another and looked at where it went along the line. The difficulty arose where you were dealing with these long distances where you had to put sheep 
that beside sheet, beside sheet, and keep them all in alignment. So it's a little bit difficult to calculate the accuracy of it. So then you had to get into trigonometry, and a friend of mine, Victor Reich, uh, in, in those days, uh, again, the year probably 2000, 2001, uh, used to use trigonometry. So if you could get the grid reference for two sites, he could use trigonometry to calculate. And he had a computer program, web-based computer program, that could work out the azimuth, or the, angular, the, the, ang the angle between them. So if you take it that north is zero degrees and east, east is 90 degrees of azimuth, we're approximately talking about a line of azimuth of about 45 degrees. I think this is the video bit, is it? So, just briefly have to show you a bit of a video. So the video is actually 20 minutes long, so we're going to skip. I'm using some software. Mm -hmm. That's just me waffling away. Yeah, we've done that. I want to show you. So this is Google Earth in action. And this shows you how you can zoom in and out on the archaeological features. And in particular then, how you can determine the alignment of them. Which makes it a supremely useful tool for someone like me. Waffling for God's sake. <laughs> anyway, observer there in the chamber of the Calibiris house on winter solstice is looking towards County of Loch Crew in the distance. And that's quite a distance away. Actually, I can measure that now. So if you've never used the ruler tool, <laughs> I'll just shut up now. <laughs> Mini me do the talking. So uh, this is how the ruler tool works, it's very handy. Uh, the European standard now is kilometers in Ireland we changed from measuring in miles to measuring in kilometers. Excuse me, about fifteen or so years ago. I've never been able to use to kilometers. I'm so used to it. <laughs> 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 This video was recorded live, there was no editing.
Sandra Keith out there somewhere. And, uh, and also has associations with Don Depp, who was the chief of the two of the Dan. Um, and I, so I wanted to look at this alignment that Michael Deems had written about uh, in his book. And uh, so I, I did this drawing of the line. I have one. Here's one I made earlier. The red line is, it turns red when you save it. So just to show you what I did, I made, I made a line. <laughs> So this shows you the precision of it, how precise you can view these alignments. for that but I think that demonstrates and that's the lovely thing about showing you the video is when you zoom in and in and in and in and in and you get a real close in view uh, and then you zoom out again with the line tool in Google Earth it was an absolute revolution in the type of work I was doing in, in terms of investigating alignments because no longer did you have to put maps down on the ground and use thread, draw lines, and all the rest. This is a much handier way to try and ascertain that. So just uh, going back a little bit to James's, James has a number of proposed alignments radiating from Ishnak. I'm not going to examine all of those. There's a reason for that, it's mostly to do with time. <coughs> um, I did investigate some of the other ones. So he proposed an alignment from Ishnak towards Talche or Taltan, and Shlieve Bra in County Loud. Shlieve Bra is a, a barrow cemetery consisting of somewhere between 30 and 40 barrows. And Dunaney Point, Dun Onya, the fort of Onya on the coast of County Loud, a distance of 60 miles or 97 kilometres. That is pinpoint accurate. Now, he also proposed an alignment from Ishnak to Klotta or Hill of Ward through uh, Newgrange and or now uh, and that's not accurate in terms of if you draw a line through Klotka it passes just to the north of now and if you pass the line through Newgrange it misses Klotka so that doesn't have the accuracy of the summer solstice alignment um, I'm not sure what that tells us but you know the idea of an observer standing at Ishnak and watching sunrises and sunsets over eminences in the distance. This doesn't negate that necessarily, but it just shows that there is one of the alignments in particular that's extremely precise. Again, another alignment that was proposed was with the hill of Tara and Fornox. Now, as Tara, I used the Mound of the Hostages, which is the oldest of the monuments on the hill of Tara, a Neolithic uh, passage mount dating to 3000 BC and as you can see there's some there's a lack of correlation there <clears throat> so back to our summer solstice alignment I found this in the schools folklore all of the schools folklore is online now a fabulous resource again 
uh, 15 years ago, I used to have to go to the library in Drogheda and ask them to fetch the microfiche rolls from the county library in Dundalk. And that would take several days and you had to go back again. Have you ever used a microfiche reader, a microfilm reader? You have to scroll through stuff and it's very tiring on the eyes, I find anyway. All of the school's folklore for, for I think most of us anyway, is online. Certainly all of school's folklore for Meath and Westmeath and Louth is all online at dukas.ie. And you can search it now because volunteers are going through all this stuff and retyping it so you can search it by keyword. So if you type Ishnak in, you get loads of results. This is one of them. Once St. Patrick met a witch on the hill of Ishnak. She was practising black magic, naughty girl. <laughs> St. Patrick banished her away from the hill of Ishnak and sent her to the lake of Deravara, and she never returned. <laughs> okay, read as much as you want into that. There's lots that you can read into that myth. One of the things that you can read into it is the patriarchal control of the church and the denial of the sacred feminine, etc., etc. She who was uh, adored and worshipped in places like Ishnak, Eriu, uh, in places like uh, Loch Crew, where she effectively created the landscape and was the essence of the landscape. The bell paddy came along and he wanted to change all that. Well, what do you know? If you threw something from Ishnak towards Derivara, you'd be throwing it along the al alignment proposed. Derivara, of course, as some of you will know, is associated with the, the story of the children of Lear. Uh, and it is kind of swan-shaped in that it has the long neck and the beak and kind of the outstretched wings. Uh, very, very peculiar uh, lake and a really beautiful place, absolutely packed with historical sites, fan oaks and ancient settlements. So anyway, I just thought about this. What was Patrick throwing? And of course, it brought into my mind stuff I've written about in Island of the Setting Sun about the fact that, for instance, Lou Lovefada was very adept at throwing things from his hand. Lou of the long arm or Lou of the long throw. And one of the things that he threw, of course, was the, uh, the, uh, the stone that killed Balor in the Battle of Moitura. So, yeah, let's just for the moment consider the feminine uh, goddess character in all her different guises. So we first meet her at Ishnak, where Eriu, who gives her name to Ireland, and the story, if some, some of you won't be familiar with it, the story is quite simply is that when the Milesians came to Ireland to take Ireland from the Tua de Danon, they battled with the Tua de Danon, and there was slaughter on either side, and eventually they met at Ishnak, and each of the goddesses, the three goddesses, Eriu, Bamba and Fola, asked the Milesians if they would name Ireland after them. And, they, and Amrigan, who was the spiritual figurehead of the Milesians, agreed that the country would be named. So Fola and Bamba are mystical, poetic, alternative names for Ireland. Eriu, of course, is its principal name. And then at Lochru, as I said, the Kalyak who creates the cairns and who is the essence of the landscape and who leaves her name there very, very definitely. Uh, she is also uh, at the Hag's Cairn and the Hag's Chair. I could divert a little bit and talk about um, the Olive Fola. Uh, there's a strong belief in modern times that Cairn Tea was the burial place of Olive Fola. Uh, that wasn't a local tradition until the 1860s when Eugene Conwell, the archaeologist, was very impressed with something Samuel Ferguson had written in his book Rude Stone Monuments of uh, Europe, their uses and meaning, etc., etc. And it was Ferguson who first proposed that uh, La Crue was in fact the burial place uh, for Calche or Teltan, in much the same way as Brunabonia was proposed as the burial place for the high kings of Tara. But of course, archaeology has since proven that to be a little bit difficult because they're separated in time by about 3,000 years. And of course, at Shreve Gullion, the Kali Vera's house. So an, an abode. And of course, the she brings to mind this word she, 
the mounds were described in Irish in the in the local tradition as she. They were never called passage tombs until the archaeologists came along. They were called she, and she to me is an untranslatable term. It's often translated as a fairy mound or a, a fairy hill, but the fairies are of course a very late arrival onto the scene. They're like, you know, only in the past couple of centuries. They're like the diminished gods. The she are the access points. The abode or the places from which the gods migrate between worlds. Interestingly, MacKillop says in the Oxford Dictionary of Celtic Mythology, Eriu is traditionally described as wearing circlets or rings, which may imply, along with the etymology of her name, an identification with the sun or moon. Of course, that's the sort of stuff that gets me excited. <laughs> so just to recap some of the things that you might have heard in the video, an observer standing at Ishnok, but not at the Stone of Division, so we'll explain that in a moment, looking towards Kerenty and Loch Crew, and in the distance, Street Gullion, is looking along the line of sum summer solstice sunrise. Conversely, an observer in the Calivira's house on Schlieff Gullion, so stop that, is looking at winter solstice sunset, not only over the Cairn T of La Cru, but in the distance also over Ishnuk. And then the moon, so the full moon is always opposite the sun. So winter solstice, full moon rise, winter solstice sun is setting in the southwest, and the full moon is rising opposite that in the northeast, coming up over the Calivira's house in Narama. And of course, conversely, summer solstice, sunrise in the northeast, and opposite that is the full moon set, pretty much in the winter solstice position. So one of the crucial things we were coming to this is that Loch Crew is not visible from Isle of Mirren, nor is Sleep Gullion. The cat stone, as some of you will know, is on the lower southwest slope of Ishnacht, away from the peak of the hill, roughly speaking, St. Patrick's Day, from where Sleep Nicolia is clearly visible. And here's a picture that I took up at St. Patrick's Bed of the Loch Crew Hills with Cairn T clearly visible. So that's your waypoint. The Cairn on the hill. Uh, I just wanted to say in relation to intervisibility of sites, that doesn't seem to have been important. <laughs> in terms of you couldn't maybe see one site from the other, that doesn't mean that they weren't able to align them. So for instance, Four Knox, and Newgrange are not intervisible, but yet they're aligned solstitially. And yet this alignment is extremely precise, as we've shown these are screenshots from the video, where you can zoom right in, you can see exactly how precise it is, crossing through Cairn T very precisely, and onwards towards the Calivira's house. Yeah, that, so that pathway actually is more northerly than the alignment. I was getting excited about that, but anyway, you need to be. Total distance, 63.8 miles or 103 kilometres. Accident or design, you decide. At the end of the day, we can't know this for sure. We can only allow, uh, I suppose, a number of factors to come into play. The design and layout of the cairns in the landscape. Uh, the fact that, for instance, many cairns point to other cairns. So even at Loch Cruz, there's a whole lot of local alignments where cairns point to other cairns. For instance, Cairn V at Loch Crew, uh, Cairn U at Loch Crew is aligned on the sunrises at the beginning of winter and the beginning of spring. And as the sun is rising, it's rising over the hill of Tara. Conversely, when you're standing on the hill of Tara at the, at the uh, Dumham and Meal, the Mount of the Hostages, at the Altana and Lunasa, the sun is setting into the Loch Crew hills. Um, I suppose that there are people in the academic world who are studying these things and who are relying on more statistical uh, investigations. Um, my instinct tells me in relation to what I have found, so I'm speaking personally, that there is absolutely nothing that was done in the Neolithic that wasn't very carefully planned and executed. So people think they're only rough piles of stone, they're not only rough piles of stone. One of the fabulous things about Newgrange is the crafting of an alignment, a very precise winter solstice alignment, in which a very narrow beam of light enters the chamber. And yet this is a beam of light that is shaped by unhewn, unworked stone. Okay, there's some surface dressing. We're not talking about stonemasons who straightened the faces of stones to make straight corridors. They created something very organic. 
They created something very precise, but the stones were left in their natural organic condition, the condition in which they were retrieved from the face of the rock at Clotter Head in County Louth and brought to Brunabonia by barge. There is absolutely nothing in my experience that's accidental about what these people did. So that closes the first part, the second part, and now for something completely different, or as Columbo would say, <laughs> just one more thing. So now we get to the centre of the universe. So Ishnak is, I suppose, I suppose really it is the heartland, isn't it? It's the spiritual centre, and it vies with Tara for that title, doesn't it? And there's so much that's familiar to me, and I'm only just getting familiar with Ishnak. So I rely on the experts like like uh, Marty and, and Justin uh, to fill me in on the archaeology and the mythology. But where it vies with Tara is in this idea that, you know, it was the centre of things. And, you know, the whole idea of the fire and the other fires being lit. Well, the same tradition at Tara, where nobody was to light the Easter fire before the High King. And to do so off with your head. It was punishable by death. Didn't stop St. Patrick from lighting the Paschal fire. Huh? Right? And all the battles that ensued there between the two of them. And sure didn't didn't he turn the sky dark and it was hailed stones made of fire and all sorts of wonderful stuff happened. Somehow, miraculously, Patrick manages to convert half the Druids of Tara into bishops without uh, losing his own head. But before I leave the subject, one of the fascinating things about the myth of St. Patrick, sorry, <laughs> the known history of St. Patrick could be written on a postage stamp and his mythology fills vo volumes and that's what I've been told and I kind of probably agree with that that there was an, East, an Easter fire in Ireland before Christianity that's what that story tells me so this is a field near Newgrange uh, where something very magical happened during the summer you can probably guess where this is going uh, so this is a very recent picture. Uh, but this is my car here, and this is me. And if you look very closely, you can see a white speck, and that's my drone controller. So the drones are the most wonderful creation for second to Google Earth, or maybe maybe ahead of Google Earth now. Drones and Google Earth are all a guy like me needs. An eye in the sky, and when you have a monumental landscape, and so this applies to Brunagonia, it applies to Loch Crew, it applies to Tara, it applies to Ishnaf, it applies to so many places. You can only truly get a real sense of the place from up there. It's like they built these places for the gods, looking down, you know. Great job, guys, you know. And what you see on some of the megalithic art, you know, the concentric circles and stuff, you also see when you're looking down on the hill of Tara and places from the sky. So uh, for the last few years, I've been flying this drone over the landscape of Brunabonia at all times of the year. Looking for stuff and usually imaging what's there. What's there in the case of this is the ingloriously titled Site P, <laughs> which is funny because it looks like a Q. <laughs> <laughs> or an O with a little bit added on. Anyway, this is a site that Geraldine Stout, uh, I was on, on a walk today uh, of Newgrange Farm. This is all land owned by Newgrange Farm, the Red House family, lovely family. And we were on a walk there today. We were in the middle of that, oh, fabulous, amphitheatre-like monument, you know. Geraldine is one of the few archaeologists I know who's interested in mythology. And she went to the Dinshanicus and she looked at all the descriptions of the monuments of Brunabonia and she reckons this is Cashel Angusel. Angus is Cashel down by the Boyne. And do you know what, a Cashel... As some of you will know, the archaeologists might know, a cashel is usually a stone fort rather than an earthen one. And of course, during the summer, some very interesting features turned up, which suggest that the embankment of Site P is made of stone, covered with earth, of course. So here I was on the evening of July the 10th, Tuesday, July the 10th, 8 p.m., flying my drone at Brunabonia, on the advice of Steve Davis, the archaeologist from UCD, said, you should take a look at Site P, because it's going to show features that you've never seen before with the drought. And I went down there excitedly, and of course he was 100% right. I have seen Site P in a way I've never seen it before. The scorch mark showed up so many interesting features, not least the fact that the scorching of the, the main bank suggests that there's stone under there. And this bank is about 
uh, Geraldine said today, 15, uh, maybe 20 metres wide. There's a darker area on the inner shoulder of it. Not sure what that could be. That may be the ditch. And there may be what looked like entrance is certainly this. And then you can see the little addition. There's like an, and what the archaeologists refer to as an annex on the back of it. So I was flying around taking pictures of the site peak, going, oh, geez, this is, oh, yeah, wow, wow, great stuff, is it? And then when the drone battery gets to 30%, you start getting beep, 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 land now, because if you don't land, the battery runs out, drone falls out of the sky, smashes on the ground, game over. <laughs> Flew the drone back, landed it, put a new battery in it. Ken Williams has arrived on the scene, my friend, and photographer, and so I'm doing my second flight down to Site P when behind it, in the next field, I see this broken circular structure. And to be honest with you, like you're seeing a live, like it's like a live transmission from the drones, like a live video, a live video feed. I, when I saw it, so I, my drone was coming from the east, so over that direction, I was flying in this direction. And when I first saw this, I thought, oh, somebody's been out with a tractor and driven around in a circle. And while they've been driving, they've been revving up in places to kind of skid the muck out of the ground. And then, no, but within a few seconds, as I got closer, I realised, oh, no, that's crop. There's a crop there. It's just... And so I shouted out, what the hell is this? <laughs> Ken comes rushing over, and the two of us have our drone controllers side by side. And because they're radio transmitters, they interfere with each other. So my screen goes blank, and I, just, um, I, I couldn't see anything. And he goes, what, what are you seeing? I said, there's a huge circular structure in the field west of Site P. So he separated again by about 10 or 15 feet. When my drone came back on, it had turned the other way, and I found it difficult to control it for a few seconds while the interference went away. But then I, 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 I focused again, and I moved closer. And as I moved closer, I began to see what looked like outer rings of what I can only describe as dots. And I was like, oh, holy God. <laughs> now, you have to understand, so New Grange, Brunabonia, UNESCO World Heritage Site, the most studied archaeological landscape in Europe. <laughs> And guys like me and guys like Ken, we know the archaeological layout of the landscape inside out. We've read all the reports, all the books, including Instar. Instar was a report produced by Steve Davis and Connor Brady and a whole lot of other people, Kevin Barton, in 2010, that found a whole lot of other stuff that had never been seen before. Nothing has ever been seen in this field. And within 20 seconds of having first seen it, maybe half a minute, I knew this was a henge. Because I know, I just know that's what it is. Just nothing else can fit that size of that description. This is a henge, and a completely unknown henge. So needless to say, the two of us for the next 20 minutes flying around were like two kids who had, I don't know, stumbled upon a lottery ticket, scratched it, won 10 grand, and were, you know, gone to collect our winnings. And so... We simply couldn't believe it. I mean, it was, there was, we were in a, a state of suspended belief or suspended disbelief, whatever you want to call it, as we flew around this field. And as we flew around it, then we saw a whole lot of other features. So, for instance, uh, this henge, that's what we call it for the moment, had this sort of porch or square shaped, you know, oh, this, whatever that might be on the end of it. And, on the opposite end, it appeared to have a crescent-shaped annex, just like some of the other hinges nearby. And then we saw that there's a feature here, which may or not, may not be part of a ring fort, which is a much later type of monument. Uh, and so, as I was saying today to the people, when we were on the ground, you can't see it now, because the crop has been harvested and there's nothing visible now. But it's very hard to get the sense of scale from the images, the only thing that gives you scale is the tram lines. So this is the width of a tractor here, you know, and the whole thing is about 175 metres wide. So if, for instance, you look at, we suspect these might be giant post holes, right? Like, some of those are the width of a tractor. They're, they're a couple of metres wide, you know? And that's when your mind gets blown by the scale and the size and the, critically, the amount of 
labour that goes into the construction of this type of thing. So just a close-in view of these double segmented ditch marks. So what the archaeologists think this is, is where a ditch was dug out and another one beside it, and this part is not dug out. So a little bit, in a way, like the, the uh, causeway enclosures that you see in Britain, but much more regular than those. And so this apparently is an entirely unique feature. It's never been seen in an Irish change. Double segmented ditch uh, sections. Um, so when we landed, the first thing was, let's ring some archaeologists. This is huge. Uh, Ken one rang one of his friend, archaeologist friends, and I rang one of mine, Steve Davis. I said, Steve, um, have you got Facebook on? He goes, yeah. I'm going to send you a picture to we've We've discovered something. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and so I sent him, and in moments later, it was, yeah, wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really something very significant. I sent an email to Geraldine Stout when I got home. Actually, I rang her, and I said, she had been digging up a new range. You can actually see the dig there in the field. There. <laughs> Beside, to the east of the house. And so they were doing their dig, and I rang Geraldine at 10 o'clock at night, and I said, Geraldine, um, uh, have you got an email address that I could send pictures to right now? She goes, yeah, why? And I said, oh, I think I found a hinge. She goes, yeah, go on. <laughs> Geraldine has, is an expert on the hinges of the Boyne Valley. She's like, yeah, okay, send it through. <laughs> Thinking, he hasn't found a hinge, he's found something else. <laughs> The email reply contained the longest version of, of a three-letter word that I've ever seen. It was, wow, W-O, several lines of it. She was super excited, as we were. I mean, we were like kids. And I suppose you have to understand the, ev the evolution. This all happened very, very quickly. We were on the side of the road. I said to Ken, listen, um, we need to go and have a look at these on the computer screens. And he lives in Wicklow. And I said, why don't we go back to my house and have a look at these on the computer screen? And of course, inevitably, when we sat down and started looking at the computer screen, we were like, oh, wow. You could see detail that you couldn't hope to see on a small screen, especially when the sun is out and it's reflecting on the screen. And so the discussion came around to, what do we do now? You know? <laughs> Uh, do we wait until the archaeologists kind of tell us what this is? Or do we share them and see what happens? And we kind of concluded that we had to share them because a lot of people fly drones over Grunabonia. And uh, it seems that we had found something extraordinary. So we shared them. I shared them specifically on, on my Facebook page on Mythical Ireland. And within 10 minutes, they had gone viral. And I lost complete control of it at that stage. The next day, at half seven, the phone started ringing. First of all, the local radio station. Then the local papers. Then the national papers. Then RTE. And then I was thinking, yeah, grand. It's gonna, this is good. Yeah, a day or two, and people will be excited. And then they'll go back to normal. And then it went to Europe. And the European media started ringing. And then I was thinking, yeah, now it'll settle down. And then by Friday, it was the American media, the TV companies. And then the newspapers were picking it up. And believe it or not, a month and a half on, I'm still dealing with that. The amount of interest. And I think part of it stems from the magical way in which this has appeared. This isn't a physical monument like Newgrange that you can walk up to and have a look at and touch the stones of or whatever. These are archaeological features that are beneath the ground. But the image that we're seeing is at the top of the crop, several feet above the ground. And so the process by which this happens is that the archaeological features, you know, the pits and the post holes, that they fill in over time when the wood rots away and the organic material fills them. And they become slightly better retainers of moisture than the surrounding fields. And so what happens is, in a drought, whatever residual moisture is available is more available to the crops growing out of the archaeology than the surrounding crops. And so the crops growing out of the archaeology are just slightly healthier. Now, it's only very slight, and I know that might be obvious in this image, but the farmer walked down through the tram lines and told me he couldn't see any, anything on the ground. It's only visible from the air, because the, the differences are actually quite subtle. Then I had a look at what I thought might be an alignment of said henge, and this is very rough and ready, and not to be considered an academic study of any, uh, of any nature, but I found that if you were considered the axis of this site to be looking through an entrance in this direction from the lac or from the annex. You'd be looking 
approximately towards 287 degrees, which happens to be roughly the place where the sun is setting at the beginning of summer and the beginning of autumn. So at the Altena, as the sun is waxing out towards summer solstice, and then when it comes back again. And it's funny because, you know, just as the sun was coming back down the horizon for the harvest, the field was harvested and the image had disappeared. So there's this mysterious porch-like entrance um, with its giant posts. And there's another one, there's another one out here. Yeah. This is huge, you know. And then another site in the hedge, or along the hedgerow, uh, which appeared to be a henge. We thought we had discovered this on the night in question, but then we realised that back in 2010, the Instar report had found this. On the image on the left is a gradiometry from the Instar report carried out by Kevin Barton. And what got them interested in this site was that in the LIDAR, a slight blip or very, very hardly noticeable rise in the landscape was seen right here. And they said, well, we'll investigate that. We did radiometry. They found the remains of a passage tomb. So the passage tomb here with the passage clearly visible. And as you can see, the aerial imagery from the drought actually shows the segmented ditch better than the radiometry. So people are asking me about the new henge. What happens now with the new henge? Do we do geophys? And as I was saying to Geraldine Stout today, you could do geophys, fizz, and I don't know how much it costs to get geophys done, but I imagine it's expensive. And it might not give you any more detail than what's in the aerial images. So another thing that's really very exciting about this, you essentially have three henges in a row. Mm -hmm. So site P, the new henge, which mm -hmm. has been tentatively dubbed by the tabloid media, Drone Henge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reliably informed that it would be given a very arbitrary label, probably site P1. <laughs> and site LP2. And the, clear, the nearest sort of uh, comparison I could think of was the Thornborough Henges in Yorkshire. Now, these are slightly more apart and they have a very definite avenue joining them. So maybe not so much on the pretty circles in Somerset. Pretty is three in a row with another fourth one at a distance. So very interesting. You can see, just when you look at this, you just get a sense that the river is the most important aspect of it. Mm. It's like proximity to the water is hugely important. First of all, from the point of view of bringing manpower, labour and materials in and out, that's your motorway. In the Neolithic, the river is the best way to travel. We know from Professor Frank Mitchell's work that the River Boyne was tidal all the way up to Rossnery and Nelt in the Neolithic. So in other words, when the, when the tide was in, you could probably get boats up there with loads on them. So people arriving in. What we have to ask about these, the embanked henge takes more work, I presume, because you have to scarp the bank material and you have to gather the stones. Are these temporary henges? Were they designed because, were they wooden? Like, were they only designed for one season's use? Did, were they burnt afterwards? I mean, that's another thing that happens with some timber circles. They get burnt. All sorts of magnificent questions that have been, uh, you know, uh, sparked by these discoveries. And questions that I think we'll be asking for years. And of course, the whole, um, the whole mystery of the monuments is, is the questions around them. When we can answer all the questions, they will cease to be interesting to us. And, and then, furthermore, so this is a field full of wheat crop where all sorts of stuff is showing up, all these mottled features here, which may or may not be hearts. And if they are hearts, they may be the first evidence in the Boyne Valley of um, a sort of mass habitation. Where did the people who built the monuments actually live? We've never been able to answer that. I'm not saying we can now, but it's just tantalising evidence for the possibilities. That's another, another view of these features. And then in the northeast corner of the field, uh, uh, an item or a, a feature that's marked in the archaeological maps in the National Monuments database as a ring ditch, but which clearly shows up as what is likely to be a grooved wear timber circle or as some of the archaeologists call it, a four-poster. Not a bed, but, you know, a timber circle that has four large posts in the middle. Uh, it also, as you can see, there's two, what appears to be two circles of posts. There's also an outer, I have to stand back a bit to see that, yeah. There might be an outer uh, ditch or bank. And, even more excitingly, these super wide arcs of what appear to be post holes, but maybe ditches. And we're looking at here two possibilities either some sort of massive avenue or a super henge. Speaking to the archaeologists, 
they're more likely to go for the avenue than the superhenge because a superhenge at, at that size is probably a couple of kilometers in diameter but we don't know because to be honest with you there's so much stuff there uh, in this small space I mean for instance the uh, there's another view of it by the National Monument Service who hired a helicopter to go over the site a few days after the discovery to record all the all the things the advantage of a helicopter over the drone the drone can fly between the ground and 120 meters at 120 meters I couldn't get the uh, directly over the new hinge I couldn't get the whole thing into one image that's mm -hmm. how big it is with a helicopter you can go further so they set out to record as much of this as possible down along the Boyne, to the east of the, those are two previously unknown, or certainly not known in this detail, uh, enclosures, which are likely again to be henges. Uh, this one, uh, which sort of intersects three different fields, was seen by Ken Williams uh, the day after we made our discovery. Ken and myself made several flights over the Boyne in the ensuing days and weeks to record as much as possible. <laughs> there we are on the night of the discovery. <laughs> <laughs> Does it show? Hide <laughs> the excitement, lads. You know, we had just literally spent probably an hour or two of the most extraordinary time, uh, indescribable excitement and shaking with excitement is how I described it in my... Uh, post and I said Ken we should take an image together because you know history has happened tonight you know? <laughs> um, and this is just a coloured image of the henge that I f uh, was posted on my Facebook page by Tomás McCormick that I thought was really nice just in terms of accentuation uh, the features of it anyway just to summarise um, so we already know Bruno Boni is a monumental landscape we know that it is a multifaceted multi-period landscape the passage tombs are the largest and most lavish in Ireland, some of the best known examples in the world. There are enormous monuments which required huge input of labour. And then we see down along the Boyne what is now definitively the largest concentration of late Neolithic hinges anywhere in the world. And these type of monuments are generally confined to Ireland and Britain, but the largest concentration of them. There has to have been, in my view, a massive movement of people in and out of the Boyne Valley. This is not something, this, from the moment, now, uh, say, Douth and Nauth, the earliest ones, through to Newgrange, through to the Henges, we're only talking a period of a few centuries. I don't think we're looking at a local population. I think we're looking at, a, at the very least, a regional population. We know that, for instance, some of the stones from Newgrange came from Wicklow, some of them came from the Mourne Mountains, some of them came from Clower Head. The mace head uh, at Nauth was carved from Orkney Flint. The closest parallel to the Brunabonia passage tombs is in France. There's lots of stuff there that would suggest that we, and I say we, I'm talking about you know the, those people, but would say we, believing that maybe we were reincarnated from them, um, <laughs> that they they were in touch with the people. Uh, who built similar monuments in Britain and on the continent and that's even suggested by the link in the mythology between Loch Crew for instance and uh, Anglesey so everybody wants to know what happens next I can't answer that question because I'm not an archaeologist I can tell you that lots of archaeologists are interested in this place this is an active farm, Newgrange Farm um, the landowners are very great custodians of the archaeology. They appreciate what they have on their land. They look after it. What happens next? I haven't a clue. Um, I would imagine geophysics would be something the archaeological community would like to do. Uh, again, if it's gradiometry, who knows whether it's going to be of any, any increased value. Ultimately, the very, very best thing in terms of telling us the date is to put a trench across it and to dig down into some of those features to find some dateable material, to maybe find some pottery, some flint, some bone, hopefully human bone, maybe some animal bone. Beyond that, we cannot know. I know in the immediate short term, um, having harvested the crop, the farmer will be looking to plough it for next year's crop. And so it's entirely up to the archaeological community to make the moves. Um, as I said, it's on an active farm. Farmers have had a difficult year. Very long winter, a lot of farmers ran out of forage fodder last winter and were unable to grow next winter's fodder because of the summer. So they've had a tough time of it. Um, so 
I'm I'm not getting involved there. I mean, obviously, uh, recording the images as much as possible. Um, so we have a geotagged image where Ken flew over the whole field and geotagged everything. The archaeologists will be wanting to map all these features onto their existing maps to tell them the size and scale of them and how they correlate with the other monuments. A lot of it will be based on speculation and the best informed speculation right now is that these things date to around 2900 BC. In my mind, um, Brunabonia has been tr transformed from uh, a complex of monuments into a landscape that is truly monumental in every sense of the word. It's got tons of monuments, but it involved a monumental uh, amount of human ingenuity and labour. And essentially what happened in the few centuries straddling the uh, third century B or third millennium BC is that uh, people reached some sort of a creative and cultural zenith in which they built the finest examples of any of the types of monument that are there. And then what happens next is open to all sorts of interpretation. The stop building passage tombs and the genetics show that the Neolithic gene was largely replaced by the Beaker gene, which came in about 26, 2500 BC. And that modern Irish people are descended from the Beaker folk and not from the Neolithic people. So something devastating is likely to have happened whether that was a battle, you know, incursions, whether that was a disease or environmental factors, or likely to have been a combination of things. Whatever happened, these people arose, did extraordinary things, and then they disappeared. And essentially, that's what happened this summer in the Boyne Valley. A monument sprang up from beneath the ground and said, I'm here, have a look. <laughs> and then a few weeks later, I'm gone again. A, in the most phantom-like and almost Didanon-like nature because that's the, the myth of the Didanons is that they could come from the she and become visible in this world and remove the feth feda, the cloak of invisibility given to them by Mananon and make themselves manifest in the world. If you're looking for any more information, uh, my website is mythicalireland.com. There's a very comprehensive blog post about the discoveries on Ken's website, which is Shadows and Stone, or if you just Google the Shadows and Stone blog, in the meantime, I have copies of my books here, which I would be very glad to sell to you. I would like to say thank you to Justin and to David and all the people here at Ishna for extending a lovely invitation. I'm so glad to be here. And thank you for coming and for being such a lovely audience.